Hello and welcome to People and Profit, where we look at how business shapes our world. I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up, jitters on the markets as oil producers prepare to meet in Algeria. Will they do a deal to cut the supply glut? The multi-billion dollar industry that's built on human tragedy. We look at the shadowy business of people smuggling and find out who's profiting from Europe's migrant crisis. And we'll have a report from a Paris suburb with 30,000 people, but no supermarket. Residents fear they're becoming a commercial ghost town. First up, though, there's been more volatility on the oil markets ahead of a meeting of producing countries in Algeria. They're going to discuss measures to tackle the supply gut that's caused oil prices to drop by more than 50% in the past two years. A deal to cut production doesn't look likely, but there is pressure coming from the leaders of many countries that need higher prices to pay their bills. The Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, is among them. He's hopeful of an agreement in Algeria. We're close to a deal between OPEC member countries and non-OPEC member countries. And we hope that this month of September, we will be able to announce an agreement to stabilize the market better and stabilize oil prices. So why have oil prices stayed so persistently low despite some producers' willingness to cut supply? Well, Kate Moody has been finding out, Kate. Stephen, it's been over two years now since global oil prices began what would be a protracted downturn, pushed down largely because supply was outweighing demand. The international standard Brent crude plummeted from over $100 per barrel, hitting its lowest level in over a decade this January, below $30. Prices have slowly begun to recover, but have struggled to stay near the $50 mark. Rumors of a possible production deal have helped boost prices in recent weeks. Crucially, stockpiles have dropped slightly, meaning that there's less oil on tap. Meanwhile, ports in unstable Libya have reopened, allowing exports to resume after more than two years. That's eroded some of those price gains. Now, producers have repeatedly failed to agree on coordinated action. Saudi Arabia has been pumping at record levels and has refused to pare back unless its regional rival Iran does the same. Tehran insists that it would be unfair for it to be forced to cap output until it's back to pre-sanction levels. Non-OPEC member Russia has meanwhile signed an agreement with Saudi officials to try and stabilize the market, but the details remain sketchy and other producers are not bound to comply. There's also the risk that any deal to freeze output at current levels would have little practical effect because supply continues to outstrip demand. Now, all 14 OPEC members marked here in blue, from Indonesia to Nigeria to Ecuador, will be attending those informal talks in Algiers, along with competitor Russia. Together, those countries are responsible for pumping nearly half of the world's crude oil. Larger producers like Saudi Arabia, Russia or Canada have felt the pinch from lower prices, but their economies are more diverse and can broadly withstand the slump. More fragile countries like Venezuela and Algeria have led calls to limit output. More oil revenue is desperately needed to boost their state coffers. Meanwhile, global demand remains weak, and the International Energy Agency has further trimmed its projections for next year. Another sign the onus is on producers to take action. Stephen? Kate, thank you very much for that. Now next, turning to a multi-billion euro industry that's built on human tragedy. Interpol and Europol estimate that people smugglers made over 4 billion euros last year from the wave of migration into southern Europe. More than a million migrants entered the EU last year via the Mediterranean Sea, most paying between 3 and 6,000 euros for a journey that's fraught with danger. Many of those coming to Europe were fleeing war in their home countries. Well, to talk about how this industry developed, I'm joined from London by the author and economist Loretta Napoleone. Uh, Loretta, thank you for joining us. You're an expert in terror financing. You've recently written a book uh, called Merchants of Men on this subject. Um, can I ask you, first of all, people smuggling is not something that's new, but we have seen a huge expansion in this because of the migrant crisis or around the migrant crisis in southern Europe. Uh, can you take us through that evolution? Yes, this is not a new phenomenon. In fact, uh, it goes back uh, to post 9-11, to 2001, 2002. This is when we have seen the beginning of the migration from West Africa, but also this is when we have seen the shifting of the movements uh, of smuggling of cocaine from Colombia to Europe via West Africa. So the people that, you, that handled the smuggling on cocaine became also the smuggling 
of uh, human in human traffickers. Um, and at the same time, during the same period, so we're talking about 2003, um, some groups began funding themselves. So we're talking about jihadist group, but also criminal groups involved in all of this business. They decided to fund themselves by kidnapping foreigners, Europeans in particular. So these the three phenomena are all interlinked, smuggling on cocaine, human trafficking and kidnapping. And this is something as well that really has been exacerbated by ri the rise of groups like the Islamic State Organization. Uh, do we have an idea of where the money flow goes? We're talking about three to six thousand euros for that Mediterranean crossing. What happens to that money afterwards? Well, the involvement of the Islamic State uh, and other large groups, uh, for example, Al Nusra in Syria until recently was linked to the fact that there is a secondary market for hostages. So these groups basically buy hostages from the small criminal groups who kidnap foreigners but also handle uh, the migrants. Uh, the way in which um, an organization like the Islamic State makes money out of the smuggling of uh, human beings, for example in Libya, or in Syria is by taxing uh, the traffickers uh, for each individual. Uh, they come across the territory they control. So mm, the, the taxation varies. For example, in the crossing from Libya to Italy, um, the people that were crossing from Sirte, which is you know, the region controlled by the Islamic State, um, they had to pay 50% of their profits to the Islamic State in order to use their costs. The Islamic State at the same time guarantee that the boats were not overcrowded. So although the crossing costs more to the migrants, it had a certain kind of security that their crossing was going to be successful. So this is the kind of involvement that the Islamic State as head with human traffickers. The Islamic yeah. State group, though, has taken that really to a, a new level with things. I mean, it publishes annual reports. There is almost a company sense about the way it's run. Should that inform how issues like terror financing should be tackled? Yes, I think in the case of the Islamic State, uh, and in fact, you know, we see the same model that was applied in Syria being applied also in Libya. The, the Islamic State is playing the role of the state. Um, so if you smuggle, no matter what you're smuggling, uh, you pay a tax for this activity because you know this is an activity that produces revenues for you. Now, that is a new model. It's a very efficient model. It's also a model that links the population uh, to, this, to the rule of the Islamic State, because of course, you know, the Islamic State becomes, uh, in their eyes, the, uh, the state that guarantees their livelihood, uh, that guarantees the, their economy, is all in-house and is all inside a territory which is controlled but militarily speaking, by the Islamic State. So measures like the G20 have proposed to try and block terrorist financing through money transfers, that's not going to help here? How is the G20 measure to block terrorist financing going to stop the collection of cash at the border between Syria and Turkey for each migrant that crosses over. Impossible. How is he going to stop the boats uh, sailing from Sirte to Italy and the exchange taking place in cash? It's not. It's not going to happen. I mean, it, yes, we could do something going at the root causes of the problem, which is how is possible the Islamic State controls these territories? Why are these people migrating? Why are these people from West Africa, East Africa, from Syria, from Central Asia also, why are these people migrating? Why do we have this kind of exodus? I mean, these are the questions that uh, the G20 should address. Okay, Loretta Napoleoni, economist and author, thank you for joining us from London. Thank you. Now next, it's a town just 30 kilometres outside of Paris, but residents feel they've been abandoned after the closure of their only supermarket. The town of Grigny has a population of 30,000, half of whom live below the poverty line. The remaining few retailers in the neighbourhood say that revenues have plummeted since the supermarket closed its doors. Josh Vardy has the story. 
There are no more signs at the entrance to this mall, Bonjour. and hardly anyone inside. The shopping centre is virtually empty ever since the area's only supermarket closed for good. Employees clean the aisles as disappointed shoppers look on. I work in Paris and on my way back I used to go shopping here before going home. Residents must now take the bus to the neighbouring town to reach the nearest supermarket. 30 kilometres outside Paris, Grigny's 30,000 inhabitants split into several neighbourhoods. In the village area there are individual homes and the main street boasts many stores. But most residents live in two other poorer neighbourhoods. According to the mayor, the supermarket wasn't making enough profit to stay open. In Grigny, half of residents live below the poverty line. Shoppers paid on average 12 euros at the register, just a quarter of the average spend in the Paris region. The town's mayor says he's not responsible for losing the supermarket. It's what I would call commercial apartheid. The area was abandoned. But who has abandoned it? Aren't you supposed to be responsible for this town? Yes, amongst others, I just believe the supermarket chain didn't have the right commercial strategy for the people who live here. Meanwhile, the supermarket chain says the decision was taken after regular thefts and threats against staff. A spokesperson said the security costs at the Grigny store were ten times that of other supermarkets in the area. In July, French Prime Minister Manuel Valls promised the mayor a wide-reaching regeneration plan for Grigny to prevent this once vibrant neighbourhood from turning into a ghost town. And that's it for this People in Profit. If you have any comments or questions about the stories that we've been covering, you can get in touch on Facebook at France24Business or you can tweet me at Newstephen. Until next time, thanks for watching.